What is up? And welcome back to Beyond the Arc with Brandon Silvers. As always, I am your host, Brandon Silvers. Just finished up with March Madness. The women's side was one of the most lit tournaments I can remember. And guess what? We're moving right into the WNBA season, starting with the WNBA draft. I brought an extra special guest. It's been too long since I had this man on. Catch him over at the 9450 Network, where he writes and also hosts the only podcast I know of that covers women's college hoops, as well as the grassroots circuits with Jump Ball and Study Hall. And we're going to give him a chance to talk about all the other things he's doing over there as well. But it is an honor to be joined by Kevin K. Lewis. K. What is going on? Hey, you know how I do it. What up? What it is? What's popping? Everything is all, all good, my brother. I am so, so glad to be on the show with you tonight. And we're going to talk a lot of great things um, when it comes to women's basketball, the NCAA tournament getting into uh, some of the pro um, things with the WNBA draft coming up on the 15th. So I am so excited to just start talking about it. Well, let's get right to it, man. We just saw one of the most unprecedented things considering this era of parody in, in college hoops and everything with the South Carolina Gamecocks undefeated season, winning the championship. The revenge tour is complete. What were your thoughts on them winning the title and just March Madness as a whole. Yeah, the the first thing that comes to my mind is obviously redemption. Um, we've seen the historic run in the past three years that Coach Don Staley in the um, South Carolina Gamecocks has done. One hundred nine and three mm. is such an incredible record um, in three years, and obviously with it ending the way that it did last year. A lot of uh, speculation was coming about about a whole retool or rebuild for this team. But um, Daniel and myself, I, I, I believe that we got on our podcast and we said, no, I think they can do it. I think they can come right back. I think they can win the championship. And on top of that, I think they can go undefeated. And man, it happened. <laughs> It 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 really happened. Excuse me. It really happened, and, and I could remember after the loss uh, last year when we did talk about it, we said that there were a few pieces obviously that was missing from um, from last year's team, which was three point shooting. And that was the obvious thing um, for for everyone, and we did not anticipate Tahina Pow Pow coming in. But it it obviously helped because we actually thought that the freshmen that did work in this past tournament in this cha in, in this championship was going to be enough. To be honest with you, um, with Malaysia Fuwali, obviously Coach Down Staley, Staley said that she was a generational talent, and then with Tessa Johnson coming in as a lethal sharpshooter, I, I knew about Tessa Johnson ever since she was like in a sophomore in high school, and I was like, oh wow the way that she can shoot the ball, it's going to be bananas when she comes on campus in Columbia. So for them to do that and for them to go undefeated, go 38 and 0, and this seems like the quietest undefeated team in all of sports. Almost. Absolutely. Um, I, I just think that it was the most incredible thing in the world to see. Um, we've been on South Carolina all year long. I personally said it was South Carolina versus the field. No one else did not matter. So it's it's great just to to be redeemed um, by, by what we saw and what history we've witnessed this year. Yeah, I don't know what else you can say about Dawn Staley, but also at the same time, not enough has been said about Dawn Staley. It is... Like the resume between the playing and the coaching career is unmatched. I can't think of anybody I've been trying. I think the closest I could come up with was was not coaching, but front office executive was maybe Jerry West on the men's side. But I, I can't think of anyone else who has done all Don has done 
both on and off the court and just all she does for the culture as well. And she's a, a, a true caretaker of the game. Absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm going to say this um, on your show, on your show. I tweeted it out. Um, I believe yesterday. Don Staley is definitely going to be in the hall of fame twice. No question. Yep. Um, she's already been enshrined as a player in 2013. She's definitely going to be enshrined as a coach um, in, in the future. And I made a joke saying I won't be surprised if she decided to come on up 77 and whenever this Charlotte Sting franchise bring gets, them back, uh, you know, bring, bring, the, bring the Sting back. But if if she ever decided to want to come up uh, 77 and be an executive for the Charlotte Sting and have success here, I wouldn't be surprised if she was in for a third time as a, as an executive. But that's just the the prowess and the intelligence of Coach Don Staley, and and she's I've I've considered her um, my mentor um, for a long time. I've always followed her game when I was playing, um, because obviously um, you know I had a pedigree of being um, a feisty guard. Um, with incredible defense and uh, a, a good uh, head on me where, you know, I make the right plays. And that's all what Don Staley um, epitomized as a, as a player. So to do it as a coach and, you know, to have the the longevity that she's had as a coach already um, and to see the um, fruits of her labor, um, you know, come into effect, it's been just an incredible thing to see. Um, you know, one of five head coaches with three national championships under her belt, um, which is which is cool. And um, obviously, with uh, shout out to Tara Vanderveer who re- who announced her retirement today. Forty five years of basketball and three championships. Um, that's you know that's also incredible. But what Coach Don Staley has done, you know, not only for women's basketball but for basketball period and as a culture. It's just been so great to see, and I can't wait to see her do many more. Hey, men. So let's talk a little bit about the draft. A lot of it, actually. One thing, one reason why I had to have you on, K-Dot, you have put out the only mock draft that I've seen that doesn't just list the picks, but you've got explanations for all of the picks every single round. And I know you got another one dropping soon before the draft. And so I've just been keeping up with what you're doing. So I was like, who better to talk to? We just talked about the Gamecocks, someone who we've seen as she's transferred in and won her two rings there at South Carolina, Camilla Cardoso. A lot of talk throughout the tournament of her possibly moving up in the draft. What do you see from her as far as is she moving up? And what was it during the tournament specifically that may have caused that shift towards a little bit higher in that top four range. Absolutely. So even before the tournament started, um, I had her projected going forward to the Los Angeles Sparks. And right now, um, the mock draft 2.0 uh, is actually out. So make sure you guys go check that out on our sub stack. Um, it's on the 9450 Twitter page. It's on my page as well. Um, and I'll share it with Brandon um, as well. It's going to be in the show notes. Check it out. It's definitely something to think about when, when we're talking about Camila Cardoso. And as of right now, she is still sitting at four, even though I would not be the least upset um, if she moves up to the two or the three spot to L.A. <laughs> or Chicago. And one thing that sticks out about Camila Cardoso is that Carmilla Cardoso was already a pro even before she stepped on a, on a college campus. I will say that right now, looking at her as a scout when she was with her Brazilian national team, a lot of people have to realize that a lot of our international players, Camila Cardoso for one, Nika Mule of Croatia um, is, a, is another great example. Lou Lopez Seneschal, who is a uh, current pro uh, for the Dallas Wings, you know, these young women played professional basketball before they even stepped on a college campus working with their national teams. 
And Carmela Cardoso is one of those players. She was ACC freshman of the year when she was at Syracuse. And a lot of people don't realize that because of her um, great ability to rebound the ball and her great ability to move her feet on defense. She has one of the quickest feet that you've seen in a six, seven body in that frame. And what sticks out more about her is her rim running ability. She can go from end to end in darn near less than five seconds. It's amazing to watch when you're looking at it on film. And a lot of things, of course, she would have to work on from a uh, WNBA standpoint is a face-up game, a, a, a more uh, consistent face-up game. Not to say that she doesn't have one. She just didn't have to use it in um, in her role uh, at South Carolina. But it's not to say that she doesn't have um, one of those games. So Camila Cardoso is one of the most underrated bigs that we've seen in recent history. And it's going to be a great thing to see um, her with the Los Angeles Sparks. I think either or is going to be Los Angeles, whether it's two or four. I just okay. personally personally believe that. I think that she's going to LA regardless. And it's a win-win for anyone who gets Camilla Cardoso at one through four. It does not matter. Obviously, we know who's going number one. But if you if you go two, three, or four, it doesn't matter if you pick Carmela Cardoso is not a bad pick at all. And I just think that she is going to be headed to L.A. at the two or the four spot. Just an incredible tournament from her. Uh, the thing that really caught my eye was, as you mentioned, the, the rim running ability that's always been there and has always been impressive. Like she just goes. But her ability to pass out of double teams – I was super impressed with in the tournament and she was even more intense with establishing her position in the post. It felt like whether it was to get the ball and also as a screener, she just seemed to up the intensity so much more in the postseason. And I was like, man, this looks like a top pick in the draft. Obviously we know who's going number one and we're going to touch on Caitlin Clark in a little bit, but Camilla in L.A. So who do you have the Sparks pairing her with? I have her pairing with Rakia Jackson. I have I have Rakia Jackson going at two. And the reason why I have Rakia Jackson going at two is because in this draft, she, in my opinion, is the most pro-ready draft prospect in this draft, even though I just said Carmela Cardoso is very well pro ready. Yeah. But I think that Rakia Jackson is the most pro ready from her size to the way she plays the game, to the way she scores the ball, to the way she rebounds the ball. She gives me a she gives me vibes of a Simone Augustus and Shamiqua Holesclaw type vibe. Ooh. And the the way that she's able to just have a feel for the game and make shots and the the way that she makes those shots. Yeah, it could be a little more efficient. But again, she was in Tennessee. She needed to score the ball. The volume of shots were unlimited for Rakia Jackson. So let's get away from the efficiency for a minute and let's just talk about the context within how she needed to play. If she goes to L.A., I think that Kirk Miller can put her in a Dewana Bonner type role, just like you saw in 2020, 2021, 2022 with that Connecticut Sun team. That matter, as a matter of fact, if we want to go to the first uh, to the 2022 season, the finals team with John Quill Jones, A.T. coming back late, Dewana Bonner. Um, I can see her in that Dewana Bonner type role and also to pair with Camilla Cardoso, which mind you, Azure Stevens is going to be out for 12 weeks because she had the surgery, I believe, on her um, elbow um, is going to be great to see. So I think that with Rakia Jackson at two, you have a sure score, which I believe that L.A. needs because L.A. I think was in the bottom 
in scoring uh, this past year. And also when you have someone um, paired up with a Dierica Handy, right? When you have someone paired up with a Ari McDonald, when you have someone paired up with a uh, Isaiah Cook, I think that that will help um, Rakia Jackson a lot as well. And I think the scoring will increase along with um, the defense that Camilo Cardoso is going to bring um, in that in that front court, especially spelling those minutes with Azare Stevens being out for the next um, 12 weeks. So I think that Rakia Jackson is the better uh, choice at number two for L.A. because you're going to need that scoring as opposed to Cameron Brink. And I have Cameron Brink, number three, going to Chicago, which will be a great compliment to the team that coach Teresa Weatherspoon is assembling. Everybody knows that Coach Spoon is a defensive specialist. She coaches and develops very well. She developed Zion Williamson while she was at uh, – while we – while she was with the New Orleans Pelicans. And you saw the great um, improvement that he made from an efficiency standpoint and just from a staying on the floor type standpoint whether um, when he wasn't injured. So I think that the development of Cameron Brink could be a little bit better in Chicago mm -hmm. than it would be in L.A., even though L.A., she'll, be, she'll still be in California. It'll, it'll give the, the star appeal, obviously, but I think from a fit standpoint, she fits better in Chicago with Teresa Weatherspoon um, alongside Elizabeth Williams in that front court. Yeah, I think people are doing the Cameron Brink kind of gives off Hollywood vibes. So we're going to put right. it with the sparks, which could happen. I don't know. But I, I agree. I do think if it's me picking, I'm picking Rakia Jackson number two personally. The big thing, we just talked about the Gamecocks. They did a fantastic job defensively on Caitlin Clark. Rakia Jackson, there wasn't a whole lot they could do with Rakia Jackson. That's probably Absolutely. the biggest compliment I can give Rakia Jackson. It just seemed like she was on the court and did whatever she wanted to do to the point where Camilla had to hit that three at the buzzer in the SEC tournament to preserve the perfect season. So I'm with you. I'm taking Rakia number two. No disrespect to Brink, but I'm letting Chicago take the like you let let us know what what big you want because I'm gonna be happy either way. Absolutely, absolutely, I 100% I agree. And even if Chicago decides to take Camilla at three, and let's just say Camilla doesn't start immediately, obviously we know Elizabeth Williams is going to be there for another year. But just imagine again. I'm not sleeping too much on Coach Teresa Weatherspoon. I know this is going to be her first year, but Teresa Weatherspoon has done this on this level before as a player. Yeah, it may look different as one chair and you're not actually playing, but I just have a feeling that this might be a special season for Chicago, whether they make the playoffs or not. I think they're going to win more games than – kind of like the experts are projecting. Um, so whether you go Camilla Cardoso at three, whether you go Cameron Brink at three, it's not going to matter because at eight, I have someone that you will probably have your eyebrows raised at, but it's a good one. Um, so once we get to eight, we'll we'll talk about that. But I think that from um, from that standpoint, my top four is Caitlin Clark, Rakia Jackson, Cameron Brink, and then Camilla Cardoso. Well, let's talk about Clark real quick, even though it's the the no-brainer number one pick. The TV schedule came out today, the fever on national TV. Every single night, it feels like they're just like the price is right. It's gonna be every day, Indiana fever. Uh what can you say about Caitlin Clark as a player? Like truly accomplished. Almost everything you could accomplish at the college level. Certainly individually she did. Absolutely. Coming in, she's bringing in newer fans. Fans who get offended at the term adjustment period. You're a WNBA historian. Please explain when people are saying adjustment period for Caitlin Clark, 
What is the difference going from college to the W and why might there be an adjustment period for a player we've seen who's super skilled, can score, can pass, great player? Absolutely. So the adjustment period is simply time. The The speed of the game is 10 times faster in the pros than it is in college. In college, there are certain coaches that are stuck in ways where certain sets seem slower than others. And mind you, in college, there's a 30-second shot clock. In the WNBA, there's a 24-second shot clock. So everything is already faster. And with Caitlin Clark, obviously, she is a transcendent player. And what I mean by transcendent player is she helps navigate the gravity of everything from a defensive standpoint to make sure that her offensively, whether she scores or whether she play makes, is a positive play. And she transcends the game to a level that we probably couldn't ever imagine. Now, I will say this on record, saying that Caitlin Clark and um, mind you, I am incredibly objective with this. Caitlin Clark has definitely been part of the reason why we've seen such a big wave of fans come into this side, come on to this side of the spectrum of women's basketball, which is all fine, all dandy, no arguments whatsoever. So when we're talking about someone like this. And when you look at the differences, we're talking about a guard who is coming directly into the WNBA already with a target on their back. That's one thing. The second thing is from a defensive standpoint, we need to see how you're going to fare one-on-one against WNBA talent you can be hidden you can easily be hidden in college because you can play zone it's not very likely you're playing too much zone in the WNBA because of the defensive three second rule the reason why you don't see a lot of pros play zone is because of that defensive three second rule you have to be out of the paint defensively three seconds and near a man almost at all times. So with that being said, that's where the adjustment period is going to come in at. It's not necessarily offensively because obviously I think she will be able to get her shot off anytime she wants. I do believe that she will be able, even though she wasn't efficient in the national championship, she's pretty much, I don't know if Coach Christy Size is going to just give her that green light because you have uh, Erica Willa and uh, Kelsey Mitchell's still there. Yeah. But if she has an open shot, I'm pretty sure Christy Saz is going to tell her to take the shot. So with that being said, again, the adjustment period is just easily time. And a lot of casual fans just don't understand that. Um, this, is, this isn't this is Candace Parker in 2008. Candace Parker was a 6'4" versatile player that the WNBA has pretty much never seen before. Candace Parker was a taller version of Cheryl Miller, if you will, a person that never played in the WNBA. So to be that, to be able to rebound the ball and take the ball 94 feet, dribbling and handling the rock and making the passes that she made and making the shots that she made, that's something that is unheard of it was unheard of then that's why as a result she was rookie of the year and mvp in the same year and she she almost single-handedly turned that sparks franchise around even with the down year the year before when lisa leslie was in and out of the lineup because of injury so we can't say the same about caitlin clark now what i will say is i truly believe that caitlin clark will be a plus six For the Indiana Fever, meaning the year before they got the year before they got Aaliyah Boston, I believe they only had four or five wins. When Aaliyah Boston was the number one overall pick, 
that win total went from four or five to 15. That's already a plus 10, plus 11 win share. With Caitlin Clark, if I'm saying she's plus six, that means in a 40 game season, you could potentially win 21 games. Potentially. With the roster that they've made up. And I still believe that executive Lynn Dunn is going to make some more moves. Um, I believe that she could make some draft moves and move some players that's already on that roster. Now, that's not saying that I know anything. That's just me speculating just as um, as an analyst, because I do truly believe that there is probably one more move that you need to make. And maybe you need to use the draft to make that move. So with that being said, I think that Caitlin Clark can be able to come in and make an impact. But now that we've seen 36 nationally televised games, am I a little weary that my 21 game um, jump from 15 to 21 could be in jeopardy? Yes, because now they're nationally televised games. 36 of them are nationally televised games. How will the Indiana Fever respond to nationally televised games versus locally televised and WNBA app televised games? So that could be a huge difference, but we don't know yet. I still have them projecting on plus six, 21 and 19. I do have them projected there. I can't say for certain if they will make the playoffs or not. So I will hold that. But I do believe that with Caitlin Clark being added to the fold, I think that they can win six more games than they did last year. And they're putting together a lot of talent there. Absolutely. Like you said, last year's rookie of the year, Aaliyah Boston, uh, Nalissa Smith. You got all these fantastic players. Grace Berger, who I'm really high on. Absolutely. They got a lot. Like you said, I do think they got a little bit of a log jam that they got to get themselves out of and and make some moves. But it's almost not fair to expect Caitlin Clark to come in and do something that Candace is probably the only t- person to do. I mean, I was trying to think of other rookie seasons where I was like, okay, uh, probably Asia, Simone Augustus. Yeah. But again, we're talking about a guard. I don't think people understand the the newer fans, at least. And there's no shame in being a newer fan, by the way. I mean, you got to start somewhere and you start at the right time. Absolutely. But they're also rolling straight from, look at all the basketball Caitlin Clark just had to play. Absolutely. Straight into the W season against the best 144 players in the world. So I don't think it's a slight to say there's going to be an adjustment period. I think it's unfair to put a ton of expectations on her because I don't know. I know she's hyper competitive and and truly driven to be great, but she's going up against 143 other women who also are. And most of them, except for the ones we're talking about tonight, they've they've had some time to rest, recover. They know what the grind is going to be like. So I think it's fair. I think what you're saying is fair. Like, she's certainly going to have an impact, especially offensively. I am curious as well. Can she defend? I know there was a lot of talk of they tried to hide her on defense to conserve her energy for offense. But sometimes that can lead to bad habits. So I'm I'm curious to see what that one-on-one defense looks like because they got some hoopers in the W. But again, I do do think she's clearly – a fantastic player going to have a fantastic career. We'll just see how, how quickly that comes along. Do want to touch on Cameron Brink really quickly. Offensively never really had to carry the load too much at Stanford. Even when she was a leading scorer, they had Haley Jones was kind of the focal point. And then this past year with uh, Kiki Iriafin. often does she project in your mind as someone who could be, that number one scoring option. I know she seems to be adding the jump shot a little bit. She's got some post moves. What does her career look like? The the ceiling of her career, I guess. I think from, from this standpoint, looking at it now, her ceiling could definitely be all-star potential. I think that if she tries to pattern 
her game like, let's say, an Asia Wilson. I mean, not from a superstar standpoint, but at least getting that face up right, right? She she can obviously shoot the rock. We've seen her shoot. We've seen her um, make a, a pretty good percentage from the three-point line. Um, but again, she wasn't asked to score a lot. She really wasn't asked to score a lot in, in Tara Vandiver's system. Um, so that's the that's the the adjustment that I would like to see her make. And I think in Chicago is probably going to be the same thing. She might have the same role in Chicago that she did at Stanford. Someone who is very, very versatile and athletic that can defend. And another thing that I really want her to, you know, get acclimated with is stop jumping so much. You know, you fouled out nine times this year. Mm. So foul trouble is definitely going to be something I'm, that I'm going to look at. Can she stay on the floor long enough? Right. Um, but if I had to put a ceiling on it, I will give her uh, I will give her the season after Asia Wilson um, came back from the from the foot injury. Um some, somewhere in that area where she um, where she elevates her game and her ceiling could be maybe a 2019 um, uh, or maybe even a 2021 Asia Wilson, um, but not necessarily the MVP caliber Asia Wilson, someone that obviously can possibly put the ball on the floor give you a couple jump shots um in the mid range can probably step up step out um to the three point line and obviously defend um your tail off so i think that Cameron Brink can get there but again it all depends on where she lands now if she lands in in LA that could be something totally different her ceiling could be i would say um if i were to think of it her ceiling, I think, could be maybe in the Cheyenne Parker range, hmm. um, where someone who is, ext- again, extremely versatile, can score the basketball, but also on the defensive end can give you a couple block shots and actually keep those shots in bounds so that you can uh, run in transition. But I think Cameron Brink um, overall will have a tremendous um, career and I do think that um, she can do a lot of great things uh, and potentially become an all-star. Yeah, I've really enjoyed watching her develop, specifically on the offensive end throughout her career. I know she was like a terrible free throw shooter, and now right. she is one of the best. So I'm expecting the offensive game to to kind of fill out around that, but you never know. Uh, with everyone else's mock mock draft basically having the Sparks go Cardoso and Brink, how would that work? How much of an overlap is there if they did go that instead of going what I would the K dot route or the Brandon route and picking Rakia with one of the bigs? So it wouldn't be that much of a of a hurt because if you remember in the national championship year, if I'm not mistaken. Cameron Brink played the four. Um, I believe that there was there was someone playing the five in that national championship year, and I know that Ashton uh, Prechtel, um, who was a freshman at the time, six six, can shoot the leather off the off the rock. She played the five, and she played more uh, more on the outside where um, Cameron played more on the inside, but she was actually the power forward. We turn around the year that Ole Miss upset them. Lauren Betts was there. And That's she right. also played the four. So I think naturally Cameron Brink is a power forward. Naturally. So I don't think there's going to be too much of an overlap if they decide to go Brink and Cardoso at two and four, to be honest with you. So it actually works out for them. And if if I am continuing to be very transparent um Cameron Brink will have a better career 
at the power forward position. If she stays at the power forward position, then she would um, go into the five. I will kind of compare it to, and I, I always hate comparing it um, to the men's side. An Anthony Davis type situation where we know that has been on record. Anthony Davis hates playing the five. Hates it. Yep. You know, so I think it could be something like that. Um, where as opposed to if I were to compare and I just said the ceiling could be a 2021 Asia Wilson, Asia Wilson embraced that five role, especially in her MVP year. And especially last year when Candace Parker went down with the foot injury. Um, So I don't know if Cameron Brink at this stage of her career is going to continue to accept it. Maybe she says she doesn't care right now but i think in the back of her mind i think she she feels like she can have a better ceiling at the at the power forward position than she would at the center position even though no matter what position she plays i think she's going to make an impact i agree she definitely feels like more of a four to me uh so it could work with like you said with the if the sparks go against our advice I think it would still work out fine, but I would be I would be interested to see her in Chicago with Coach Spoon. The only time I doubted Teresa Weatherspoon is she hit the half court shot against my comments <laughs> back in the day. So I learned right then and there, never doubt her. So there is one one big name we have not talked about yet. That's those are the top four picks. We've kind of been curious about which order they're going to go in, but it, those seem pretty set in stone. Angel Reese, LSU, I know we were talking on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. We were both hoping she would declare for the draft. She did. Where do you see Angel going? Angel can go anywhere between 6 and 10. But in my mock draft, I have her going to Chicago. Okay, this was the surprise, the, the eighth pick, right? This is this is the surprise and the reason why I can see Angel Reese in Chicago. Imagine Angel Reese and Teresa Weatherspoon. Imagine Ooh. personality. Right? And I call Angel Reese a generational rebounder, a generational defender. Angel Reese has such a pure knack of rebounding the ball. It is just amazing to see. I don't care how much you don't like her offense, her, her offensive bag. Do not care how much you don't like it. At the end of it, Angel Reese is a generational rebounder. And I know generational has been used very loosely nowadays, but this I mean it when I say she is a generational rebounder. And Teresa Weatherspoon would definitely love to have her at eight. I think that Washington will look at her at six, and I think that Washington will pick her at six, but you don't go wrong with Angel Reese from six to 10. My original mock draft had her down to Connecticut at 10. And the reason why I have I've been meticulous in these certain teams is because Angel Reese is going to need a place where they have someone to put her in a position to be extremely successful. I think the Connecticut Sun is a perfect place for her at 10. I think that the Chicago Sky, which has grown on me in the past three weeks, would be a perfect place for Angel Reese to grow as well. Imagine Injuries, whether starting or coming off the bench, because I know I have Cameron Brink at three. So imagine if Brink does move up to the five spot and you put Angel Reese at the four spot. That's how are you going to score? There will be no rebounds and no, if you get a shot up, there will be no rebounds and you might not get a shot up. You're probably not going to get a shot up. And think about Elizabeth Williams, who's already oh a great defender. Yeah. Ooh. So, so you take a look. You take a look at these. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it sounds crazy to go two power forwards in the first round. Maybe it sounds crazy, but 
when you look at that dynamic, I think that it can work. And with Angel Reese, again, she will light up any arena. She will um, be a force for any team that picks her six through ten. Um, I see. I've seen other mock drafts have her going at seven to Minnesota. And me personally, Minnesota, it doesn't matter who you pick if you're in Minnesota. I think they're they're pretty much set. Whatever position, like in any position that you pick at seven, I think you're set. It's not going to matter. Um, so I've, I've seen Angel Reese at seven. I've seen Angel Reese at, at six. Um, I think that Washington personally needs a point guard. Um, so I have J.C. Sheldon going to uh, mm-hmm. Washington at six because she's a big body point guard, 5'10", 5'11", who is obviously a great defender. She can shoot. She can make plays. They just, um, well, Natasha Cloud is now in the Valley of the Sun so with the Mercury. So they need a point guard. And my original um, – my original mock draft had Georgia Amore going six um, to to Washington, but now she's returning. She's now going to follow um, Coach Kenny Brooks to Kentucky, so that strikes her out out of the list. But I have J.C. Sheldon in my mock draft going six, but Angel Reese can go six, seven, eight, nine, or ten. I don't think she'll go nine to Dallas, honestly, um, because we haven't talked about the fifth pick which I have Aaliyah Edwards going number five to Dallas, which I think would be a perfect compliment to Tierra McGowan, Satu Sabli, Arike Agumbawale, and the rest of the Dallas Wings um, players there. So it's very, very interesting with um, Angel Reese. But like I said, from six to 10 with Angel Reese, honestly, you cannot go wrong. And could she be someone who maybe gets more playing time early on because she can defend and rebound the way she defends and rebounds, and she doesn't necessarily need you to run plays for her on offense? Yes. And the way, and to me, what I'm thinking, what I'm thinking from a X's and O's standpoint with Coach Teresa Weatherspoon, that's exactly who. Teresa Weatherspoon needs. Um, think of Rebecca Brunson, um, if you will. I know that there has been kind of um, I, I know and, and shout out, shout out to Big Low, um, Lauren Dreer. Um, I know we talked about this on the spaces uh one time, and I, I told I told her that I kind of feel like um Angel Reese could be the great value Rebecca Brunson starting off um and as she develops an offensive game we would see a little bit more out of Angel Reese um but a lot of people don't know that Angel Reese is very very is a very very underrated passer and if you have someone like a Marina Mabry who is going to be the focal point of the offense if it if it looks like, you know, she's going to be face guarded pretty much all the time. Nobody wants her shooting, so they're going to face guard her. So if you can get if you can catch her on back screens, you can put Angel Reese in a situation between um between the pinch post and the elbow. She can look at dumping the backdoor pass, bounce passes, over the head passes to Elizabeth Williams on the high low. You can also put her in horn sets between her and um and Marina Mabry, and she could be the decoy where she, you know, set, I mean, she sets incredible screens. Yeah. We've seen her um set incredible screens for Michaela Williams this year, Fly J. Johnson, Haley Van Lift, when Haley Van Lift did have offensive um efficiencies um in those games. So, I mean, there's everything that you can think of from a offensive standpoint point that you can use her for but mainly you know her, her rebounding and her defense especially her help side defense very very underrated uh help side defender i haven't heard a lot of people talk about her help side defense as much 
um, like I wanted to. But I think that Angel Reese is a, a great pick at at eight to Chicago. Man, I think I think you're right about like that pairing with with Coach Weatherspoon. That would be fantastic for her. But then going going home to the Mystics, that could also be good too. But I think you definitely, especially we're talking about how hard it is to even make a roster. You want that perfect fit if you are the player. Because you know, next draft coming around quicker than you even believe. So going back, I know you mentioned number five, Dallas, who I feel like they... They need they need bigs bad. <laughs> you talked about Aaliyah Edwards. I feel like Aaliyah, she doesn't get credit for being a good player because her game isn't necessarily aesthetically pleasing. Right. Sell the Dallas Fort Worth area on Aaliyah Edwards. Aaliyah Edwards is the perfect player to pair with an Arike and a Satu because She's not going to just clog the paint up for you. We already know that Tierra McGowan is a big presence in the paint, and that's probably going to be the only person in the paint. Now, one thing that you will get from Aaliyah Edwards, even though aesthetically she doesn't fit the mold of a prototypical power forward, she is going to keep live basketballs ahead of you. Imagine Aaliyah Edwards being picked that five and getting decent playing time for coach Latricia Trammell. Imagine the plus that you will get in your offensive rebounding. They were already a great offensive rebounding team with Tierra McGowan there. They were already a great offensive rebounding team with Satu Sabli there. They were already a great offensive rebounding team, even with Natasha Howard there. But imagine having someone like Aaliyah Edwards come off the bench And you can even put in a small ball lineup Aaliyah Edwards at the five and play Natasha Howard at the four. You probably put Satu at the three. You put um, Arike at the two. And who cares? Crystal Dangerfield, um, uh, Veronica Burton, doesn't matter. Put them at the one. You have a small ball lineup and Aaliyah Edwards will be able to face up. She can shoot that 12, 15 footer. She will be able to grab offensive rebounds for you. Like she's not a person that will just clog the paint up for you, but she will do everything under the sun to make sure you get an extra set, an extra possession. Second chance points will definitely skyrocket if they do indeed pick Aaliyah Edwards at five. And even though, again, I call it uh clumsy, right? She does seem sometimes a little clumsy and you want to kind of watch out how she um you know how she falls how she um you know tries to put herself in a position to to be a ball hawk you know you want to be careful with that but at the same time you get quality quality play you get a quality player in Aaliyah Edwards and I think she's if anything the perfect fit at five I, it's a household thing in the K dot house in the K dot house where we say that Dallas just had just wants needs and wants bigs. Yes. Think about it. They traded for for Suarez last year. Suarez didn't even play last year. They already have Tara McGowan. Even though Owat Courier, she's not going to be there this year because of the Olympic obligations. That is a per- Aaliyah Edwards is a perfect person to sp- to use a Watt Courier's minutes. She's the perfect person, even though a Watt was a little bit farther away from the basket. Aaliyah Edwards can put you at least to the elbow, but she can give you more rebounds. She can give you more screens because a Watt wasn't the best screener, so she can give you more screens for Enrique for um for Satu. You're coming off the Spain pick and roll. She is a perfect candidate for the Spain pick and roll. She is a perfect candidate for blind pig. Blind pig is basically screen to screener. She's a perfect candidate for a lot of things that Dallas can do. And I think that she can be the reason Enrique Agubanwale's efficiency can go up if she uses the Aaliyah Edwards screen 
the way that Aaliyah Edwards can scream. Mm. Man, I think I think you're right. Mostly about Dallas, they need bigs. Please, Dallas. <laughs> if you're big, go to Dallas. Please. Everything's so, bigger in Texas, right? Exactly. <laughs> except the Dallas wing. Like, please. Get, <laughs> they took the the wing name too literally. Like, they need some Dallas posts as well. So, please. All right. I will make y'all check out the show notes for the rest of K Dot's first round and honestly everything else. But I do want to cover foreign players who we need to be on the lookout for and some sleepers too. So let's start with the foreign players. I know you just mentioned Olympic year. That might be affecting who who came over, who entered the draft and everything. But who's going to be there that we should know and we should be on the lookout for? Obviously, I so it's crazy. I think I have three international players, two of them in the first round for sure. One of them coming right off the bat. No, I actually have three of them in the first round. Three of them in the first round. Um, They could potentially be stash picks. Um, This is the important thing to to consider. And shout out to Rachel Galligan because she also mentioned this on Twitter. Look out for the stash in draft, the draft and stash. Please look out for the draft and stash this year because obviously this is an Olympic year. It's not going to take um, any effect for any salary caps um, that that comes about because the player has decided to stay international. So it do- is not a cap hit on the 2024 season. So I have three of them. And the first one is at number seven, Nia Pouch from Australia. Very young, gifted player. She's only 19 years old, but she is another Awat Koyer, if we were to make a comparison. Um, she has incredible uh, lateral quickness, incredible footwork defensively. She is best known um, for. Um, she played for the uh, WNBL for the Link. Um, I'm sorry, not for the Lynx. Um, she played for the uh, WNBL uh, this past season. But I do have her going to the Lynx at seven. And obviously, I think that with Minnesota, I said earlier that Minnesota doesn't really need any potential player this year to make any impact. I think they're they're kind of set um, from a roster standpoint. So if you do pick someone you're probably going to pick an international player and you're probably going to stash that international player until they're ready to make the jump to the WNBA. And I think Nia Dupouch is one of them. The second one at number nine to Dallas, Dallas has a whole bunch of picks. Got to pick somebody. Um, Leela Lacken from France. She is one of the quickest point guard combo guards that I've seen on film in a while. We talk about Maureen Johannes and her ability just to make unbelievable plays. Well, Leah, Leah, Leah is taller and Leah, Leah is more of a scoring threat. This is also in my opinion, a stash pick because she is also young and she is also going to more than likely be a part of the French national team and will be competing for the 2024 Olympics this year. So I don't expect her to come over this year, but she is about five, nine, five, 10. She has such great quickness. Her defense is, is up there. Um, She can shoot it um, when she's wide. Like you can't leave her wide open. Like she can, she can shoot it. Um, one thing that I would like to see her do better is, um, you know, better decision making. Obviously, she's young, right? 19 years old playing pro. You're going to have um, immature mistakes, and that's that's common. But for Dallas, if they were to get her in, let's say, 2025, or even if she decided to come over in 2026 when the new CBA comes along, which would be probably smarter um, because it's a new rookie scale. I think that she would be an immediate 
impact if Dallas were to continue to hover in the lines of playoff, fringe playoff team, first round exit type teams, looking for somebody to take them over the hump. Because again, her quickness is lightning. Her ability to put the ball in the basket is incredible. And again, she can shoot the rock. And to pair her potentially with a Satu Sali and an Enrique Agumbawale, that would be very, very interesting to see. And I was then, watching her highlights today, and I was uh-huh. like, she was, you're right, the Marine comp is very good because I was like, what is she doing out there? Yeah. But she was making them. Yeah. And my last one in the first round, Izzy Borlais out of Australia. Now, the New York Liberty, they need to do something. The reason why I say they need to do something is because we haven't seen any type of crazy moves that they made in free agency. Obviously, they wanted to keep the core. They they needed Stewie back. They needed John Cole Jones back. They got him back. Now, the problem is they need someone who can come off the bench, who can defend a little bit, and who can, all, who can also score a little bit more. They didn't have that last year. And to say that they lost to an Aces team who lost two starters because of the lack of perimeter play, that is says a lot. And I think Izzy Boles is a incredible pickup at number 11 for New York. Now, will she come over immediately because of the Olympic year? We don't know, but she is older than the previous two prospects that I mentioned, and she is pro ready. Now, my comp for her is think about a bigger Sammy Whitcomb. Oh, okay. Someone who has the driving ability yes. of Alyssa Thomas. So if you can shoot like Sammy Wickham, but then you have the driving ability of Alyssa Thomas, imagine having her in the backcourt with a Courtney Vandersloot or having Sabrina play the point guard position. Because we know that we we know that it's a possibility that Maureen Johannes will not come over this year. It is a possibility. Now, we can't say that she's she won't, but there is a possibility. Now, Izzy Borlase, in my opinion, at 11 would work because she spreads the floor, but then she knows how to put the ball on the floor and she can draw the fouls. I mean, when I tell you the body control and how strong she is when she's driving. It's so hard to to contain her out on the wing, but it's even harder to contain her when she's getting to the bucket. So to me, after looking at that type of film, I was like, no, New York needs this type of player. My original, my original draft had Celeste Taylor at number 11 from Ohio State via transfer from Duke. But when I looked at Celeste Taylor um, and what she did in at Ohio State, I think that for me, New York needs someone who's ready now. I think that Celeste Taylor is more of a Rebecca Gardner in training. So you can't have, if you're looking for a championship right now, you can't have someone in training. You need someone right now. And I think Izzy Boles is, is the, the perfect fit. And also she's from Australia. Sandy Brondello obviously oh, yeah. knows her. I mean, <clears throat> it's a no brainer almost. Um, and I think that she, I think that she would be a great fit for, for New York at 11. Man. All right. Well, before we wrap up, who give me a sleeper or two we should be looking out for in the later rounds? Someone who, if you're not familiar, the later rounds, they have a hard time, just like the rest of the players sticking to a roster. Who might make a roster and also contribute? 
you know what? Charisma Osborne dropped in my um she she dropped <laughs> in, in in my in my mock draft. Um everybody has her at 11 going to New York, but I have her going number 14 to the Seattle Storm. Mm. And I think she is a perfect fit to complement Jewel and Skylar Diggins Smith in a storm uniform. And she can be able to learn from a jewel, from a Sammy, from a um from a Skylar Diggins Smith. And I think that she will be able to complement those players. It, it, and again with with a with a NECA, um that's that's there as well. Um she will be a great bench piece. She is on the she is on the uh, more mature side. She was a fifth year um, for, at UCLA. Again, her decision making wasn't the best this year. We saw it in the um, in the Sweet Sixteen versus LSU in the at the end of the game. You know what what was going on? Why weren't we giving the ball to Lauren Betts? I mean, you are the fifth year senior out there. You need to gather your team together and say, listen, we need to give the ball to Lauren, no matter what. Um, so yeah, decision making will be um somewhat of an area of improvement. But if you're going to a team that has veteran guards like Jewel, like Scholar, like Sammy, it's a win-win for you. So that's my sleeper um for the second round. And I got one more for the championship. Uh, for the back-to-back champions, Las Vegas Aces. And that's Leilani Correa, the guard out of Florida. I think that she can make this roster. I know that they just signed Bree Beal um, to a training camp deal, but I truly, truly believe that um, Leilani Correa could potentially make this roster and just be another scoring guard from a practice standpoint, someone that can spare some minutes for a Kelsey Plum, um, someone that can spare maybe even some minutes for uh, for an Alicia Clark. You know, she's a she's a bigger body guard. I think she's about I think she's at six foot. Um, has a wingspan. If if wingspan was included, she could be closer to six one. But incredible innate ability to put the ball in the hoop and also um she's a very underrated defender in my opinion when she is on defensively she is on um so i think that she could potentially make a roster but those would be um two of two of my immediate sleepers that i truly believe could potentially uh make a roster spot um for for their respective teams oh i'm sorry i have one more oh let's hear it i'm ready i will say about charisma I do think, like you said, didn't quite have the season we thought she was going to have, or I'm sure she wanted to have, but she just screams spark plug off the bench to me. Mm -hmm. And Leilani, yeah, she can fill it up quick. And I think you're right. I think the scoring kind of overshadowed the fact that she can lock it, lock down as a defender too. So uh, I'm, I'm right there with you, especially as an Aces fan too. I would not mind that pick at all. But yeah, let's, let's get one more sleeper for sure. One more sleeper, and again, I'm talking about the Aces. I'm talking about the Liberty. I mean, we already know that they will be in the in the top top four. We will say, but I think Nika Mule at 17 to New York would also be just as good. We've seen the defense. We've seen the defense in the Final Four. If you can get a Courtney Vandersloot who can defend. There you Hello. go. Yes. There you go. You go bigger body and from a scoring standpoint in the first round, you get a smaller body, but from a defensive standpoint in the second round. And I truly believe that both of those players can make that roster spot. And at that point, you just let the chips fall where they may. You allow JJ, you allow um, Sobley, you allow uh, Stewie to do their thing, right? I know. And then you also have um, Kayla Thornton. 
that's going to play the four. So you have four, you have four of your bigs right there that you can interchange right there from a versatility standpoint. And then you look at the backcourt, Sabrina, Vandersloot, um, Benajelani, right? You have Izzy, and then you have Nika in the backcourt. Interchange that. That's a that's a non-woman rotation right there that you can pretty much interchange and go from there. And I know that they signed um Rebecca Gardner, but Rebecca Gardner is not going to be available this year. She tore Achilles in February, so she's not going to be available this year. So um, part of me is like, why would you make that trade knowing that that injury happened? But it's going to be a potential future um, asset for them. Um, But if you want it now, I think that that's what New York has to do. But overall, those are my three sleepers that I know and could potentially uh, make a roster spot um, for these respective teams. Man, I really like Nika to the Liberty. Because like you said, pretty similar style to Vandersloot with the added bonus of defending uh, as far as her playmaking. And also, at the end of the season, literally, in the finals, it looked like Vandersloot had gotten really fatigued. Absolutely. And so they need someone there who can spell her more often. I know they were trying to figure out the rotations and what everything looked like last season. I'm sure Sandy has a better idea heading into this year. So now it's going to be, if I had to guess, yes, we're winning games, trying to get that one seed, but also can we get to the playoffs healthy and ready to perform? So I, I love that mule, mule pick especially. So. I think I don't know why you're not a GM. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> oh man, listen. Uh in, in due time, brother. In due time. Um imagine the the CBA conversation uh that that I have brewing up. Um please look out for that. Um I have a special podcast um brewing in regards to the current CBA that the WNBPA and uh, league um, recently, uh, well, not recently, but uh, back in 2017, um, signed off on, um, which is set to expire. It, it They're going to opt out at the end of the season this year. And um, by them opting out, it'll be terminated um, October, the end of October of 2025. So they'll have this season and then they'll have next season under this um, CBA. And then they'll have renegotiations to get ready for a new CBA in 2026. Also, um, just on a business note, we do see that there is a projection that the WNBA's new TV deal can get up to $400 um, million, but we don't know over how many years that number needs to be at least a billion, a billion and a half over seven years, maybe 10 years. Um, we need to see close to a $100 million slash $200 million deal per year mm. um, TV deal going forward. Anything less than that is just pure robbery, and it'll be time for the WNBA and – for people to uh, start look start looking for uh, new leadership, um, if if they decide to go anything under two hundred million dollars, I would say under two hundred million dollars a year. If you can get a two hundred million dollar a year TV deal, that automatically skyrockets your salary cap, and you will be able to see the superstars make the millions that they act at that. Um, that they equally deserve from an equity standpoint, not necessarily an equality standpoint, because that's what they never said. They never said they wanted to be as equal as the men. They wanted an equity share of revenue. See, I'm about to go on my CBA rabbit yeah. hole. I was getting ready. To, I was getting ready to tell you what what they what they make. They make 25 percent to the leagues and owners, 75 percent right now. That is that is asinine. They don't Man. even make. They don't. This is not even 50-50. That's that's asinine. See, I was talking 
GM K dot. I might have been need to be talking commish. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, tell everybody because you mentioned this podcast you got coming out, which is going to be super informative. This man has read the CBA. I can't, but I've tried to read it. It's too dry for me, but he's broken it down. He's breaking it down on and off the court. Got that one coming out. Does everything else analyzing on and off the court. KDOT, tell them where they can find all things KDOT. Absolutely. Well, I'm mainly on Twitter, so you can always follow me at K.Lu3H on Twitter. You can also follow Jump Ball and Study Hall. That's at J Ball, the letter N, Study Hall. Again, that's J Ball, the letter N, Study Hall on Twitter. You can also find me on Instagram at K.Lu3H and on TikTok at K.Lu. Um, again, we have the CBA discussion coming up. Um, I'm trying to get some um, get some notable names um, on a panel um, along with my uh, um, illustrious guests, uh, Lauren Sanders, a.k.a. Lolo Bike on Twitter. Um, also, Miss Donetta, who is a um, Las Vegas uh, personality um, in broadcasting and then with 21 titles with my homies, Britt and Tay. Um, so we're definitely trying to um, brew something up before the season begins. So please look out for that. But thank you so much, Brandon, for always um, being a great host and um, allowing me to, you know, spill my spew on, on everything women's basketball. Not a problem. I was checking. I know we're waiting on portal news. I was trying to see if it broke yet. I'm not seeing it yet. But no, man, I appreciate you coming on as always, educating on all things women's basketball, please tap into what KDOT is doing. You're going to be smarter. You're going to be a better fan. Again, cannot thank you enough for joining me tonight, KDOT. Cannot thank you enough for watching, listening, rating, subscribing, reviewing, sharing, all that great stuff. KDOT's information is going to be in the show notes. So again, check all that out. And I'm going to catch y'all later. Peace. Peace out.